Today's topic is universal constructions. These are constructions in mathematics that can be represented as an initial object in a certain category or equivalently as a terminal object in a certain category because as you know the notion of initial object is dual to the notion of terminal object let me just remind you that an object i is initial because in fact i don't remember now if we <laughs> looked at this concept before an object i is initial if um for every have we looked at this concept before I think so, oh, in the, maybe the second lecture or so. All right. So an object I is initially for every object I is there is unique morphism. So we are working now in a fixed category. Um, and in that category, an initial object is defined this way. Uh, and because the notion of terminal object is dual to the notion of initial object, we will have basically the same property except that the direction of the arrow now reverses which does significantly change the um, property so now we require there to be unique arrow going into terminal object so when a, when a construction arises um, as an initial or a terminal object in a in a certain category um, this construction will be unique up to isomorphism. And that has to do with the fact that um, any two initial objects are isomorphic to each other. And hence, duly also, any two terminal objects are isomorphic to each other. And it's not difficult to see that. It's not difficult to prove that. Sometimes I. Um, I call this the fundamental theorem of mathematics in the sense that, um, as we will see through the examples, uh, initiality or, or terminality kind of uh, captures. Uh, so uh, you first build a category before you, you carry out your construction. You build a category where objects are intuitively similar to the thing you want to define. And then you're able to formalize exactly what you want to define just by saying that that object should be initial or terminal. So the process of formalization becomes, um, the, so the technical part basically of the construction be, um, becomes something that, that arises for free after the intuition has been identified. And so this transition from intuition to, to formal mathematics, um, the fact that this transition actually does define your object uniquely. Uh, it is, of course, a fundamental fact. So uh, any two initial objects are isomorphic. But moreover, also uh, any object that's isomorphic to an initial object will itself be initial. The proof is, is is rather straightforward. It's not. I don't call this a fundamental theorem of mathematics because of this complicated proof. Uh, rather big because of its significant um, because of its philosophical significance. Um, so if you've got two initial objects, I think we, we might have looked at this at some stage. Um, if we've got two initial objects and uh, because they're initial, you will have these arrows going back and forth. Uh, and then you compose them. And um, the composites will be these looping arrows. And um, sorry, this one is should be the other way around. And then you note that because each of them are initial objects, there must be exactly one looping arrow for each because 
uh, uh, as part of the definition of being initial when you take your x your x here to be the same object as i but we already have an arrow going from i1 to i1 that's the identity arrow so then this arrow must be that arrow so this arrow must be the identity arrow and hence we get an isomorphism so the same on the other side and hence we get an isomorphism now, if, I, if you have an initial object I and another object X that's isomorphic to it, so we will have an isomorphism running back and forth here, then you can basically transport the property of being initial in the following way. So you, you pick any other object X prime. And first you want to show that there exists an, a, an arrow from X prime to X. You know there is one here, and then you can just compose that one with, it, with the uh, F, with the isomorphism. And now you want to show that this is a unique arrow. So you let there be another one. Um, but then you can transport it back by the inverse, right? So if there's an, another arrow here, G, this can be composed with F minus one to get an arrow F minus one G. Then you know these two arrows are the same because I is initial object. And then when you further compose with F, Of course, f and f minus one cancel because I have this isomorphism, and, and so you get g actually equals to the f. -U. So that completes the proof. And then by applying this theorem in, for a dual category, we get a similar theorem for terminal object. Now let's look at examples of. Uh, constructions that arise as initial or terminal object in a certain category. Maybe the most fundamental one would be uh, the natural number system. So If we go back to Richard Dedekind, he defined a natural number system as a triple satisfying suitable axioms, which later were called piano axioms, because piano took Dedekind's work and, and uh, set it up in a, in a formal logical framework. Dedekind's work is was in set theoretical framework. Um, and so these axioms are that, um, okay, so first of all, let me remind you this S is a successor function and zero is an element of N. It's intended to be number zero. Uh, we, we now including number zero among the set of uh, natural numbers. And then the axioms say that uh, zero is not in the image of S, that S is injective and the third axiom is the induction axiom. But it turns out that you can uh, get rid of all of these axioms um, if we take a universal construction approach. So we just take the category of such triples because, uh, I mean, you, you're trying to set up a counting system here, right? And, and what is important of a counting system is that you've got a place to start counting with. And then you know how to go from, from one figure to the next one as you proceed with counting. But the problem is that there could be quite a number of counting systems. Uh, I mean, such triples, a set, a function, and an element, which are not very useful for counting. Uh, for example, you could have started from zero, then proceeded to one, and then proceeded to two, and, and then three, and then could, went back to zero. That wouldn't be a very useful counting system. Um, then another thing is, for example, you could have something that's comes before zero and then you're not interested in that when you're when you're counting whole whole entities right um, and there are also all sorts of other anomalies that you can find here but intuitively you 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 kind of feel that okay you you, you want the best type of counting system. You, you want a counting system indeed, but then you want it to really work. It, you want it to be best. And this idea of being best uh, is formalized 
as being initial or terminal. And that's the fantastic thing about this notion of initial object. So it turns out that if we now define the category of counting systems, in that category, the natural number system will be the initial object. Okay, so what would be the morphisms of such a category? Well, if I have another counting system, um, morphism, I guess, should just be a translation of one counting system into the other, right? A translation should map uh, the starting point to the starting point, and it should respect how we succeed, how we proceed from one figure to the other, which simply means that um, a certain diagram should, should commute. So if I first take the successor, and then, um, so there must be a certain function here, let's call this T for translation. Oh, I can't call it T anymore, sorry. Let's call this F. Um, and if I, if I take a number, I look at the next number, and then I translate that number into another counting system. The result should be the same as first translating my number and then taking the next next figure in that other counting system. So that um, the notion of next is coherent between the two counting systems. So it's a very na natural notion of a morphism of counting systems, very intuitive. Um, and then, of course, you define composition just by composing the functions, the Fs. And it turns out that it works out. It's not difficult to check that you will get that composite of morphisms of counting systems will still be a counting uh, a morphism of counting systems. And also, it, it's not difficult to see that the identity maps will always be um, morphisms, which gives us a category. And then we take the initial object in this category. Now, to make it completely obvious why the natural number system should be the initial object in this category, Let's write down what it means for, for, for the natural number system to be initial. It means that there exists unique F satisfying these conditions, right? Let's write these conditions out in a more traditional way. A set of diagrams, let's write them out algebraically. The first condition says that F of zero must equal E. The second condition says that T of F of N must equal F of the successor of N. And I can actually change the order around here deliberately to make it a bit more resembling more something we know. Indeed, if I um, write my s of n as n plus 1, I get f of n plus 1 equals t of f of n. And what is this? Um, this is something very familiar, right? We've seen such formulas before. We're declaring what is f of zero, and we're declaring what is f of the next number based on f of the previous number. Does this look familiar to you? Do we, do we ever do something like this in mathematics when we want to describe some function f and we, uh, which whose domain is the set of natural numbers and we, we declare what is the value of the function at zero. And then we declare that we define what is the value at n plus one based on knowing what the value at n is. Does this look familiar? Um, yes, it looks like the principle of induction. Um, this is called the principle of recursion. Oh, recursion. <laughs> you use okay. induction to, to prove something about numbers, and here you're constructing a function. Um, so this is a recursive definition of a function f, and we know that uh, it's a valid definition. We know that such f indeed exists, and it's unique. Uh, so we actually already know that the natural number system is an initial object in this category. And after that, we just apply this fundamental theorem of mathematics. So this means that if I have another initial object, then it will be isomorphic to my natural number system, which basically means it will be the same thing, except that we can just rename the, the elements of n, uh, because isomorphic here would be a bijection over n, which preserves s and zero. So it's essentially the same system. 
Uh, and then also that anything, uh, any object that's isomorphic to, to the natural number system will, will, uh, will be initial. So we, we've now, just because we, we are familiar with this property, um, in fact, Richard Dedekind was the one who also emphasized this property. Uh, I mean, he proved this property out of those three, um, if I'm not mistaken, if that's what he did, out of the three more traditional axioms. But now it turns out that this property is equivalent to the other one. So the natural number system does have the property that for any other counting system that is unique f, but also the other way around. If something, if some system has that property, then that must be initial object. And by the proof we carried out here, by that theorem, we know that that must be isomorphic to the natural number system. Um, so we, we, we get this example of a, of a universal construction. We've constructed the natural number system as an initial object in a certain category. And note that I want to come back to emphasizing this philosophical side that uh, when we were describing the objects of this category, right, we kept very minimal information about what, what, an, uh, what the natural number system should do. We only kept the information that because the natural number system should be, a, should be a useful counting system, it should count things, so we should have a starting point and a successor, and that's all we, all the data we imposed. Um, and then we, we built the category out of that, and the, then we took the best object there, the initial object, and that one turned out to be exactly the thing we were after. So that's one example of um, defining a mathematical object um, using a universal property. Uh, so, so when you say that something is an initial object in some category, it's called a universal property. Um, and now let's look at another example. So let's now go to complex numbers uh, because it's a similar situation there that you you want something to, to be true and then, and then you, to build the object for which that thing is true takes a bit of an effort, but now we'll remove that effort by by building a wider category of, of less data and then taking an initial object in that category. Um, so this time, um, our objects are going to be the following. So we, we have this fixed uh, field of, of real numbers, R, and we're looking for uh, um, pairs, um, C and I, such that, Actually, not just pairs. Uh, in fact, we're looking for, no, we are looking for pairs, so, uh, not pairs. We're looking for triples, in fact, of consisting of C, uh, um, an element I in C. So let me write it in a different way. So uh, uh, C, an element I in C. This element should be such that I squared is minus one and a function from R to C. Um, we can call this function U. No, maybe we should call it J. So what this function does, it simply, I mean, if, if this is complex numbers, if this is the field of complex numbers, then this function will map every real number to the corresponding complex number, the complex number that's actually a real number. Um, okay, but, I don't want to give a full definition of the complex numbers. I just want to do the minimal property that I, I, I'm looking for a field, and basically an extension of my field, but I don't even need to require this must be a, a, a monomorphism, an injective map. So I, I just want some, some kind of way of, of inserting my real numbers to another in another field. Obviously, I want J to be a field homomorphism, okay? Um, where in that other field, I have, a suit, I have a chosen solution to the equation x squared equals minus one, because this is the equation that can't be solved here. So I want to expand my number system in such a way that this equation is a solution. And I pick one solution out for, uh, from, for, from the system. Why do I pick one solution out? Because that's what we did, we did with i, right? We, we denoted i with i, and, and because it, I mean, there's another solution to this, right? Minus i is also a solution. So we have to pick one because there, there is more than one. Then uh, let, let the objects of this category be such data. So basically a field F, 
homomorphism of fields uh, H and a chosen element of F. Um, let's call it small f. Maybe I'll call it x, such that x squared equals minus one. So minus one is the, the element minus one in this field because h is a field homomorphism. It will net minus one to there. Of course, as soon as I said that j must be a field homomorphism um, or h must be a field homomorphism, it's automatically injective because every field homomorphism is injective. Um, unless I, I count the, the, the generate field where zero equals one is a, is a field as well, then, then it's not true anymore. But once again, I don't want to think about that being uh, injected yet. Um, so I just build my category, uh, the, the objects of my category this way. So the objects are uh, systems C, I, J. And if I have another such system F, X, H, then a morphism between them is defined as a field homomorphism. Um, let's call it U, such that uh, U maps I to X. So the chosen solution of X squared minus one should be mapped to the chosen solution in the other system. And also this U must interact uh, with J and H uh, in, a, in the expected way. So we want this triangle to commute. To, to commute. So we want UJ to equals H. And then it's not difficult to see once again that we get, we get a category out of out of this. We can compose these morphisms, and, and uh, because the composition will be defined essentially as composition of um, field homomorphisms, it will be associative and so on. And then um, I take initial object in this category, and it turns out that uh, complex numbers will be an initial object in this category. Why? Well, if you got this field homomorphism H to some other field, you can define R, a, U of A plus B I. Well, because U is a field homomorphism, it, it must be defined this way, right? But then remember that A is, is the real number. So it's J of, uh, in fact, it's J of something, right? So, um, so maybe that's how I should have written this thing. So J of A plus, um, J of B times I. And then we get UJ of A plus UJ of B times U of I. But U of I, we forced it to be equal, equal to X. Um, I'm trying to see if, if I have complex number system, I can build such U or not. Um, and if my U needs to satisfy the requirements I put forward here, then uj must equal h. And um, so we have h, a, h, b, and then ui must equal the x. So if u exists, it must be defined this way. So at least now I know it's unique. But then I, I can test easily that if I do define u this way, uh, it will actually be a field homomorphism. And so I would have established that the, the complex number system um, is given by a universal construction where it is the one, the field together with all this data of i and j that um, gives rise to the initial object in, in, the, in the category. And of course, when we work with complex numbers, we very, very much have this data in mind. I mean, we. We always know how we can think of real numbers as particular cases of complex numbers. So that's our J function. And we have this very special complex number that we uh, pointed, uh, that we picked um, to work with, the number I. So it's, once again, it's very natural um, process that, we're, that we've done here. And then uh, by that theorem again, by theorem that any two initial objects are isomorphic, I, I know that uh, I can now use this as a definition of the complex number system because any other uh, system that is initially in the same category will actually be isomorphic to the, to the complex number one. And of course, isomorphism here uh, as before means that there will be an isomorphism of fields 
which maps i to x, so that basically makes f to be the complex number system up to renaming of um, of elements of, of complex number set, right? Okay, so we've got two examples of, of universal constructions. And then a third example uh, comes from the fact that, um, in fact, any adjunction always gives rise to a universal construction. And I'm going to illustrate this on a, on a specific, in the, in, the case, in the case of a specific adjunction, uh, namely uh, the adjunction uh, between the category of monoids and the category of sets. So let's take the functor from monoids to sets that maps every monoid to its underlying set. Um, and then we will use this functor to describe a certain category. And it will kind of look like this diagram here. Um, so first I fix an object X in, in the category of sets. And then I consider um, data of a monoid a map into the monoid, in other words, a map into the underlying set of the monoid. And that's actually all I, all I want here. And uh, let me call this map, um, I'm going to call this map eta x for a specific reason, which will become apparent very short in, in a short while. So my objects of the category are m comma eta x and a morphism. So if I have another object, let's say m prime. So m and m prime are monoids, right? Uh, if I have another thing, m prime, let's say f, then a morphism between them is a monoid homomorphism, G, or let me call that U, such that when I apply the functor U to it, so in other words, I take the same, I mean, the way I define a monoid homomorphism is a function between our underlying sets, right? So when I apply the functor U to it, it basically is the same as U, with the function U between the sets of the monoid, then this triangle should commute. So which, which pair, monoid and the, and the function into it, will be initial object in this category? So I've got a set here, right? Uh, I want to turn it into a monoid in such a way that my set is embedded in that monoid by a certain function. So basically now we're doing a reverse process. So we had some kind of intuition here out of which we had identified a universal construction. Now I'm telling you what the universal construction is and we want to decompose it, its intuition so that we can then figure out what the answer should be because in the previous case, we started with the answer, right? So I've got a set X. I'm going to be inserting my set into a monoid in such a way that if I have insertion of my set and, and by the way, in the beginning, I don't even know that this function is injective. If I have insertion of my set in another monoid, then there should be a unique way of transporting this monoid to the other monoid by a unique uh, monoid homomorphism, so that my insertion into the first monoid is compatible with my insertion to the second monoid under that transportation. So the question is, what, what should such monoid be? And we can kind of try to start building this monoid by, by hand. Well, certainly this monoid should have elements of X in it. So let's begin with an example where we have, let's say two um, elements in my set, X and Y. So clearly X, uh, the, the monoid M, clearly it needs to have some version of X and Y in there. Those will be X and Y 
um, coming from the set X by the mapping eta. I probably do not want them to be equal to each other because if they were equal to each other, right, um, um, I can surely find a function f from this set to some other monoid which maps them to different places. But then if these two have been mapped to the same place by that function and f maps them to different places, then there's no way I can get a function here making the triangle commutative because since they're mapped to the same place by this function, that function will also keep them being mapped to the same place because that will be whatever this point is mapped to. And then that cannot be equal to f because f separates them. So that's how we, we conclude that actually x and y by eta must be mapped to different places in M in order for the universal property to hold. Okay, what else must be in, in M? Well, M must be a monoid, so probably there must be an identity element in M. But now we want to ask the same question. Maybe the identity element will coincide with one of the two, either X or Y. And then we use this similar reasoning where we say, okay, if, if it does, if let's say X accidentally maps to identity element here, surely we can find a function to another monoid where x does not map to identity element, so maps to some non-identity element, uh, e not equal to the identity element in M prime. And then we won't be able to, to find a u because u needs, needs to be monoid homomorphism. It cannot map one to a non-identity element, but because it, it will map one to, to the identity element because it's a monoid homomorphism. So because it's possible to find such a function f where x does not map to identity element, then eta also cannot map x to identity element. So basically, the, the pattern we are seeing here is that eta kind of should behave in a, in a very fragile way. Eta should be very much considered to the, the things that other, the other functions do not do. Like there will be functions that do not map x, x and y to the same place. So x, eta is not allowed to map them to the same place. There are functions that do not map x to the identity element, so eta is not allowed to do that. So eta must be kind of very much, um, uh, what, 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 what's the right word there? Um, very liberal, right? Eta cannot force anything to happen. As soon as one of the, one of the f's don't make something happen, eta cannot make that happen. So it, must be very much considered to all the behavior of all the Fs. So with that in mind, then we probably decide that, okay, then, then surely then X, Y cannot be either X or Y, or one for that matter, or similar argument uh, as before. And then we start building these expressions in M because M needs to be a monoid, so we need to be able to multiply things. And then we say, okay, but what about Y, X? Can x y equal y x? And then this, the same story goes. So, if x y were equal to y x in M, we would run into trouble. Uh, could someone explain to me why? What what would be the problem with x y being equal to x? Why why can't they be equal to x in in this uh, M? Um, because we could find the, an f um, such that um, x, y, and y, x um, would not be equal to each other, or f of um, f of. That's one. right. <laughs> That's right. We could, we should surely will be able to find a monoid and map x and y in that monoid in such a way that f x y isn't equal to f y simply because not every monoid is commutative. Then. That's it. And and so we we then. With, with this uh, kind of um, uh, pattern that we're noticing here, we then decided, okay, none of the combinations here can be equal to any other. Um, and so we we realized that um, this monoid M must actually be the monoid of words. All formal ways of writing the X and Y in succession 
um, as if they're letters and we are creating a word out of these letters. Now, this is similar to when we were looking at um, constructing a, a, a vector space out of a set uh, where we, here we had the, the category of vector spaces and we had the underlying set functor. And then we noted there that going back by taking all possible formal linear combinations, which is basically a vector space with a basis given set, we get an adjunction. It's a similar process here, and in fact, this M that we are trying, have been trying to to find here, um, is the the M that comes from the left adjoint of this function. So we can call it, if we call left adjoint F, we can call it F of X, and then the role of um, Eta is played by the unit of a junction. And in fact, it is true in general that um, every adjunction will give rise to this universal construction. So if I have, uh, let's say, an adjunction, uh, U is a right adjoint, F is a left adjoint, uh, then um, I, I take uh, my unit of a junction. And I set up a pair like this, where I evaluate at x with the left joint functor, and I transition from x to u f of x by the unit of a junction. This object will be initial object in the category of all such objects. What are these objects? An object m prime and the morphism from x to u m prime. Let's try to prove that why this is true for uh, for any adjunction. So to prove that for an arbitrary adjunction, I'm going to now switch from having um, the category of sets and, and monoids to having general categories. So let me call this uh, C and uh, X. And let's have the two functors there, U and, and F and maybe Instead of U, we actually want to call, uh, use the letter G because that's that was the letter we used for a right hand joint. Um, and I'm going to try to prove that uh, if I take eta x uh, into G of f of x, uh, so then I'm considering the pair fx eta x, that will be initial among all the pairs uh, C f, where f is a morphism from x to g of c. And being initial means that for every um, f that exists unique, let's call this f bar, because that's how morphisms are defined in this category, uh, such that the triangle commutes. So in other words, such that f bar composed with eta x equals to f. So first I want to perhaps produce a bar, show that it exists, and then try to show that it's unique. Okay, so what do I know about adjunctions? Well, um, the, the way we treated adjunctions formally made use of the unit of a junction and the co-unit of a junction. So perhaps I should get the co-unit involved here as well to help me build the F bar. Um, I could take my f and I could apply to this morphism, I could apply the f functor to get a morphism there. And then I have this arrow here to the g version of that thing. So then I apply g to, to that as well. So I put g in front of, of this. But if I put brackets like this over there, um, no, not like this, sorry. If I put my brackets like this, this is fg of c, right? 
Um, I'm a bit stuck here. Let me see what's going on here. So I want to get to, I want to get from here to there, right? Yeah. So I can get from F G of C to C. And that's exactly, I can do that exactly by the co-unit of a junction. The unit of a junction takes me from an object to the composite of the two functors. And the co-unit of a junction takes me from the composite of the two functors applied to an object from that to the object. And then I, I can uh, compose this with G. So I can take G of eta C. And you see, this is way, this is how by, by such composite, um, so basically going from um, fx to fg of c via f of f, right? And then taking the co-unit, this is how I can build f bar. I just now want to show that this f bar, when I apply g to that f bar, and I apologize that I forgot to put a g here, when I apply G to that F bar, I mean, if I don't put a G there, this composite will, will not make sense, right? Of course, when I apply G to this F bar, I will simply get, um, because, I've, because this triangle commutes here, this makes that triangle commute since it's just G applied to to the triangle. And so if I want to prove commutativity of this triangle, I will, I will kind of try to, to do something about the fact that I can decompose this morphism into that and followed by that. Well, it's not completely obvious what to do, um, but it's not too hard either. So it's actually quite quite an interesting argument here. Um, okay, before I continue, uh, is everybody following the argument so far? I'm following. Fantastic. Thanks for confirming, Gregor. Yes, so I'm following as well. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So if, you if if there's something you don't you didn't follow, please do interrupt me. So I now want to compute basically this composite so that I can get to F. I want this composite to equal F and, and I will use the definition of this, namely the definition of that, and try to see if commutativity of this triangle can't be deduced from some observation about this composite. There's nothing much I can do on this side. Um, But there is something I can do on this side. And namely, I can use the fact that eta is a natural transformation. So I'm going to draw that um, right down here. Actually, maybe I should draw that on this side rather. So going by eta x to g of f of x, and then going to g f of f, using that to go to g, f, g of c, by naturality of eta, that's the same as going via f to f, g, sorry, to, well, f goes to g of c, right, to going to g of c, and then using eta of, um, of which object, of the object uh, g, c. So that's what natural transformation does, right? I've got a morphism. I apply the identity functor to it. I apply the other functor to it, which is the composite GF. And the natural transformation connects the objects in such a way that this square always commutes. So by naturality, this square does commute. And that allows me to decompose this 
this composite into, into that one. And now I further compose that with that and see what happens. So then let me then expand this diagram a bit to insert the other diagram here to make it uh, more obvious on the diagram what's going on. So I'm going to uh, move this out a little bit like that. So we've got F here and we've got uh, GF there. And now we are inserting some additional uh, information there. So we're basically inserting another copy of G of C, another copy of F, and this map eta G of C. And now we know that this diagram here, uh, this diagram commutes, we also know that this diagram commutes simply because we've got just f and identity there. So the question is whether this commutes, because if that commutes, then the entire outer diagram would also commute. Um, can anyone remember why, why this diagram will commute, this one? Um, because of the universal property that we assume? We're not assuming universal property, we're proving it. Oh, um, <laughs> um, oh, uh, I remember because of the uh, definition of a junction. Of, That's right. Um, the property of eta. That's right. It was, we had two, uh, two conditions uh, relating eta and epsilon. Uh, they're sometimes called triangular conditions because of the triangular shape of the diagram that represents them and this is one of them so this is one of the two conditions we put on the two natural transformations how they relate to each other so the fact that okay let's let's write the whole thing out now uh, uh, algebraically so we have uh we want to prove we want to see what g of f bar composed with eta x equals to f bar has been decomposed as um eta c composed with f of f that's was the definition of f bar so this is by the definition of f bar remember that's how we build f bar then uh because g is a functor this is the same as okay this should be eta not of eta circle but eta of c sorry about that because g is a functor we have this composed with that and i forgot about uh eta x here, sorry about that. And then I, I'm not putting the brackets around composition because composition is associative. We know that very well already. So now we compose the things on this side here. And th there we use naturality of eta to say that, okay, that composite must equal uh, what we had there. So eta g of c composed with, uh, composed with f, so this is by, naturality of eta and then um, and this composite is actually identity of g of c and that's by definition of uh, junction and then that equals f which is exactly what we wanted to prove right Fantastic. So we, we've proved existence of, of F bar. We've proved that such F bar exists. And now let's prove that it's unique. So let's kind of try to prove that we were forced to define F bar 
this way, and there was no other way to define a file. Okay, so now we will use this diagram as, a, as our assumption, right? We start from this. We know that f bar is such that that diagram commutes. And what we want to prove is that this triangle commutes. So this is now reversed to, to what we had before. Now we want to prove this part. If this triangle does commute for some, and then let me actually change the notation here. Let's call this, uh, let's say, G. If this diagram does commute, then um, it will mean that G is the F bar we already constructed, and hence G is unique because we constructed F bar using this composite, right? So what we want to prove then is that if I have a G that makes this triangle commutative, that G must equal to this composite. How to do that? Okay, let's see how we can do that. Haven't done this for um, more than 20 years, I guess. If you, if you have any ideas, please do tell me. So when you don't know what to do in category theory, you just take the things you have um, and you combine them. And maybe that's a general principle in mathematics as well. So the first thing I'm wondering about, what would happen if I take, because I, I want something to, to happen on the side of the category C, right? This, this diagram lives in category C. What I've got here is something that lives in category X. So my assumption is inside category X. If I want to make use of it inside category C, it's natural that I would want to first maybe transport this into category of C. And there's only one way we can, uh, well, not only one way, but the first obvious way we can transport from, uh, from category X to category C is by the functor F. So let's apply a fun functor F to this diagram and see what happens. If I apply F to that uh, diagram, I get F, G, F, X. F, X. F, eta, X. F of F. F, G of C. F, G of small g. I get that this triangle uh, commutes. Will I be able to relate somehow this triangle with that one. Do you have any ideas how we can relate them? Let's look at some pieces of, of these triangles. So we've got basically these two diagrams and we kind of want to relate them in order that we could use commutativity of one to get commutativity of, of the other. Surely there, there is a way to relate um, some of the objects in the diagram, right? Like this one, for instance, relates to C by um, the fact that it's actually the same object as this one over there, right? So in fact, what I could do, um, what I could do here is to compose both of these with beta C. 
to arrive to, to C, right? This commutes, therefore, the, the this will equal that. Okay. Um, now there is something I could I could do on this side, isn't there? Using naturality of uh, eta. So I could I could draw G right here, and that's nice that I get to draw G now because maybe we're now close to the proof. I could draw G, and here I could draw um, eta of um, of f of x, couldn't I? This diagram does commute by naturality because uh, we've got a morphism G. We apply to it identity functor, so it remains G. Then we apply to the uh, to it the functor FG. And the, this eta is just, epsilon is just transformation between those two functors. And so naturality means that this uh, diagram is commute, indeed. So now we know that the, the, the big diagram commutes because this, this commutes, that commutes. So these two commutative diagrams can be pasted together to see that this composite equals, sorry, this composite equals that composite. And that's almost what we wanted here because this composite is exactly that composite. So if there's a way I can get this thing to equal just G, then I'm done. Do you notice how we could get this equal to G? Um. I do, but um, um, should I say what I uh, see? Why not? Or should I wait? For uh, why else? not? <laughs> uh, can you can you just give me maybe um, one minute to start writing the algebraic proof, and when I arrive to that step, then you can tell me, and meanwhile the okay. others can can uh, can think about it as well. So I wanted to prove G equals to that composite, and I would go about it by taking this composite F of F, eta of C equals, so then first we make use of this equality here, equals eta of C composed with, um, I mean, I make use of this equality first, composed with F of, G of G composed with eta X. Then I use functoriality of F to get to this. And then I use naturality of eta to get to this. And now the question is, oops, sorry. Um, no, that's right. And now the question is, why is this equal to G? Does anyone else also have uh, an answer to this question? So then Gregor, uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, so we use uh, again the um, definition of the junctions and the that's right. uh, property of yeah. epsilon. And in fact, this is the second property, right? So the definition of a junction is uh, once we we have functors and natural transformations, this equation that these two things are equal, and the other one that these two things are equal, and this is uh, the full the complete. Uh, so we've kind of made use of all of the properties of of an adjunction here in this proof. You see, we, we made use of naturality of eta, we made use of uh, naturality of epsilon, we made use of functorality of both f and g, right? So we, we made use of a, of a lot of information, basically all the information uh, that a junction holds. Uh, and we, we we proved what we wanted to prove. We, we proved that this thing is unique. Uh, and so we, we proved that um, for any adjunction, 
the construction of uh, the value of the functor on object X uh, can be recovered as a universal construction. It gives, it can be recovered as an initial object in this category of, of pairs. And by that fundamental theorem um, that we mentioned before, uh, we know that this is un defines it uniquely of isomorphism. So we could actually recover the entire functor f. I mean, so far we only see that we, f is being recovered as far as its values on objects are concerned, but it's actually possible to prove that the the universal property, this universal property, will also fix what the values of f should be on morphisms. And in fact, it's also possible then to go backwards. So if I have a functor G, such that for every X, such pair exists without yet knowing that this F is a functor. For every X, such pair exists. So an initial object exists in, in the category of such pairs. Then assigning to X, F of X, will give me a functor F that will be, that will form an adjunction with G. So we arrive to yet another uh, approach to adjunctions. We already had um, a couple of approaches, right? We arrived to yet another approach where now adjunctions can be defined um, using uh, a universal property. Okay, so once we clarify this example, uh, the general case of adjunctions, which is actually not just example, but uh, a nice link between the two ideas, um, we have at hand a whole bunch of other examples. Everything that was a special case of a junction now can give me a universal construction, a universal property. And moreover, as this example, I mean, as this exploration here shows us in the remarks at the end I made, um, in fact, we can think of a junction as um, kind of um, formalization of universal construction relative, relative to factor. So the whole concept of a junction becomes now um, one of the faces of, of universal construction. Uh, the other example I would like us to look at, and, and we'll probably explore the example in, in further detail. Sorry, be... Prof. Sorry, Prof. Yes, yes, Charles. Yeah, yeah wow. just one more clarification. Can you go back to that diagram? The, uh, go down a bit. Yeah, yeah, there, 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 there. Yeah, the diagram on the on the on the left. When you before, when you started with eta c, right at the point you you put eta c before you put all the other arrows and the object at the top of uh -huh. uh, f g c. Mm -hmm. It just at that moment when we said that E C, I was wondering why don't we then comp because that is you we took you lifted that uh, triangle from the from uh, C to X, then why couldn't we get eta composed with uh, F capital letter F of F to make G from F of X to C. Which is what we're worried about at the triangle on the top or right. But we didn't want to create G. We wanted to show that if, if we have some G for which yeah. this is commutative, then the same G will make that commutative. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering why are we not going that path, but I think it wasn't very clear to me. Now I, I understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, okay. Thanks for. So just, just to recap, um, in light of this question, just to recap that in the beginning, we that's what we did in the beginning. We defined this G as the composite, and then we made sure that the G works, that this triangle commutes. But now we wanted to, to prove uniqueness of G. So if I have something else um, that makes this commutative, that other thing I wanted to prove is equal to the F bar the first G. But this being equal to the F bar means that this G equals to that composite. And um, that composite 
being equal to G is exactly uh, what we were looking for here. That's also why we have a question mark. Okay. Um, so now let's look at the notion of um, a limit of a diagram. So let me remind you what that is. Well, maybe it's 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 now time to define a diagram a bit more formally than we've done before. Um, so let's say we have a category C and we have um, a graph G. So by a graph, I mean a category without composition and identity morphisms. So it's a data of objects and arrows. Um, just take the definition of a category and remove from the definition of a category the parts which talks about composition and identity morphisms. Then you get a notion of a graph. So if I, I have a graph G and I have a category C, um, I can define a diagram D um, over the graph G in the category C to simply be a graph morphism. So it's it's something that preserves objects and arrows, preserves their uh, domains and codomains. There is no composition here, so D is not required to preserve any of that. On the picture, the way we can draw something like this is, is for, for instance, the following. Uh, imagine, let's say I take my graph G to consist of two objects. Um, a and B. I could now consider a diagram in C by perhaps mapping both of these objects to the same object. So let's call that object. Um, in fact, let me call these things, let me call these ones X and Y instead. And so D of X, let me define it to be some object C. And D of Y is the same object C. Um, by drawing C twice like this, right? So by kind of removing that, I'm already encoding the information not only about the D, but also about G. So if I have a, a drawing like this with C appearing twice, the, the way to recover the, the graph is just to disregard that these are the same C. So disregard the labels, just think of these as separate objects, separate entities, and you can call them anything you like. So it will, this recovery process will, of course, be up to isomorphism of, of graphs. And then once you recover these objects, it's kind of the shape of what you've drawn here, then you can recover the values of D just by looking at the labels that have been inserted. Okay. Um, now, the reason why I give this example is that I want to give an example of a limit. So if I take a limit of this diagram, a limit of this diagram, as you know, will be a product. And it has a uni universal property, namely it is terminal among all such cones. So as we know, the product consists of uh, pi 1, pi 2. And if I have another object with f1 and f2, then there will be unique error going that way, which makes each of the triangles commute. So we can recognize here that some kind of universal construction is happening. Let's, let's try to formalize the universal construction that's happening here. Um, and let's do that in the, in the general case. So suppose I've got some diagram D that has been displayed in the picture by some shape, which gives me the shape of the graph G. And the labeling then determines uh, how D is defined. So maybe somewhere here, I'll have an, an, uh, a vertex label. Um, labeled by D of X. 
And uh, now I, I want to define a category in which the terminal object will be the limit of this diagram. So objects of that category are pairs consisting of L, an object in CL, and the family of maps. So I need one for each vertex on my picture. So I need one for each object in G. Here you see pi one and pi two are different from each other, even though they have the same codomain. So pi one and pi two are not indexed by C because then it will be pi C in both cases, they will be equal. They're rather indexed by X and Y. So I, I want a family of these, of these maps. I'm going to call them pi X, pi Y. Um, so family of pi X's where X is an element of G. And each pi X is a morphism from L to D of X. Now, it's not just an arbitrary uh, pair like that. I want these triangles to commute, one for every morphism f in, in the graph G. So if I have some f from x to y in G, I want this triangle to commute. This, this would be the definition of a cone over a diagram. So for every f from x to y in, in G, I want that um, pi y equals d of f composed with pi x. And, and these are going to be then the objects of my category. And now I need to define morphisms so that the terminal object will be exactly the limit. Okay, let me make a bit more space here still. I want to put this on the left side there. I think I need more space. There we go. Okay, so if I have another object, in fact, uh, to be honest, I actually want this to be down here. Uh, if I have another object uh, of, of the same category, and, and what, so what would be another object of, this, of the same category? So some object, let's say C, so it should be a pair, C, and, and a family, right? And a family of some P of Xs, where each Px is, is, a, is a morphous from C to D of X, where X is an object in G. And then again, the same condition as the other one holds here. So for every F X in Y, from X to Y, I want um, P of Y equal to the composite of P of F and P of X. So on the, on the picture we'll have this P of X. P of P Y, sorry. Um, but of course there, there are many of these, right? There is as many as there are uh, objects in the graph. So I've got two objects now. The, the C and the, and the P family and the L and the Pi family, and a morphism between them is defined as a morphism from C to L. Let's call it F, which is um, coherent with those two families. So if I basically that such that these triangles commute, and that should commute for every X, so it should commute for X, for, for Y as well, and so on. So, so that for every X in G, We've got that pi of x composed with f equals p of x. So this will be the notion of a morphism in the, in the category of cones. So these, these things are called cones. Uh, and then the terminal object in this category, basically by definition of the limit, is the limit. So the limit of a diagram is the terminal object in this category. 
And duly, uh, I mean, we didn't prove yet that this is a category, but it's not difficult to prove that. I've been skipping those proofs in all the other examples as well. So with morphisms defined this way, you can then prove that if you compose one such morphism with another one going out from L, let's say, uh, then that composite will still be a morphism and, and it will be associative because basically morphisms are defined based on how morphisms are defined in the category C, since F is a morphism in C, and composition of morphisms in the category C is associative, so that property then gets inherited. Um, and so we get that the limits are also examples of universal constructions. And then dually we have the same story for colimits. Let's look at um, a very specific type of a colimit just to have it have this more example more concrete. Uh, something that's called a push out. So this was a general kind of example that covers all limits here, and now we're going to look at a specific one. Um, something called a push out. So what is a push out? In a push out, the graph has this shape. So that's x, that's y, that's z, and there are two arrows in the graph u and v. So a diagram over such a graph will consist of some d of x, some d of y, some d of z, and some d of u and d of v. And this is our basically now the, the complete picture of what before we, we drew using this weekly zone. Now here we have the complete picture for it because we have a complete picture for the graph. I mean before the graph was not just that, it was a lot of things and it's just one representative morphism in the graph. Okay, so we've got this picture here. That's our base over which we'll be building the cones. But in, in the dual case of Colimit, which we want to look at now, the arrows will be going upwards instead of going downwards. Um, so a Colimit of this diagram will be the initial object in the corresponding category. And the category consists of things going upward. And immediately I make the following remark, because these triangles need to commute, this one and that one, I can kind of get rid of this arrow. So remember, a colimit needs to be uh, a family consisting of an object C, sorry, a pair consisting of an object C and this family of arrows that let me call these yotas, yota x, yota y, and yota z. And the the triangle requirements um, now is that for every arrow, you see for every arrow in the graph, something needs to happen. There are only two arrows. So there are two things that needs to happen. So we've got a C with, with a Yota family there. And the two things that need to happen is that um, this one is that this triangle needs to commute and the other one is that this triangle needs to commute. So Yota Z um, composed with D of V, needs to equal to yota x. That's by applying this condition right here, uh, and the dual of that, of course, uh, for the arrow v. And similarly, for the arrow u, the same yota x needs to now equal to yota y composed with d of u. But of course, these two equalities determine yota x uniquely, right? If they both need to equal yota x, it's sufficient we require they're equal to each other, and then yota x will just be defined as something that, that's equal to both of them. So we can kind of get rid of, of yota x in this uh, uh, framework. And if we do get rid of yota x, then the picture becomes simpler, and we basically have just those and these, and then I can draw them as a kind of a, a, a diamond. So I could draw dx here, I could draw dy here, dz, and then I draw c right here. And uh, I have dv here, I have du there. And I only draw yota y and yota 
z because yota x, which, which runs this way, is now determined by the rest of the data. And now being having this universal property of initiality in, in the category of these co-cones would amount to what? So, so now let's imagine I have another such thing. So I have a C prime with another data of, of arrows going into it. So some I z, some I um, I y and some I x, but keeping in mind I don't need I x anymore because I z composed with D B needs to equal to I x and that needs to equal to I y composed with D U. And on my blue diagram, I'm going to draw C prime this way. So these are now the i, y, and the i, z. And, and the fact that uh, the first picture was initial object means that there is a unique morphism from C to C prime. So there is a unique morphism from C to C prime, but it's not, it's not a unique morphism altogether. It's a unique morphism with a certain property. It's a unique U, which is a morphism in the category of, of such pairs. In other words, it's a unique U such that um, U compose all the triangles commit, right? So if I draw U here, it's unique U such that this U makes the triangles with the yota and the I commute for each object, not, not just for Z, for Y as well, and for X as well. So let, let's write all this out. It's a unique U such that U compose the yota Z equals i z at the same time u composed with yota y must equal i y and at the same time u composed with yota x must equal to to i x so this is just this requirement that the morphism f needs to when, when i compose with projection of of the other cone it needs to equal to the projection of the first cone and here we're dealing with co-cones, and so co-cone injection composed with the morphism must equal to the other co-cone injection and so on. So we've got that you needs to be unique satisfying these three qualities, but even here we can get rid of the, the equality with Ix because as soon as U satisfies these two, the third will follow. Why? Um, since U composed with Yota x, where now yota x we know equals to that. So let's write it down. Let's say u composed with yota z composed with dv. So that's what um, u composed with yota x is, right? That will equal, you see, u composed with yota z, z, we know it's iz, right? And we can obviously use associativity here. So we have iz composed with dv. But um, iz composed with dv um, is equal to ix, you see, from here. So this third equality comes for free, just like the third arrow came for free. So we could disregard this yota x entirely, and then our definition of a colimit over the specific diagram becomes something that's called a push out. So you've got a diagram that that's uh, L-shaped like this, and then its push out consists of an object with two arrows like that, such that if I have another object and two arrows like this, then there exists a unique arrow connecting C and C prime such that these triangles one and two commute. Obviously, I think I forgot to say that originally this, this needed to commute. Why? Because, uh, because of this requirement, this needs to equal to that. So push out is not just any diagram. It's it, um, so once again, I start with an L-shaped diagram. A push out consists of these two arrows, which does make 
this square commute so that if I have another pair of two arrows like that, which makes this thing equal that thing, so kind of the, the expanded square commute, then there must exist a unique U, which makes triangles one and two commute. And this is very similar to the definition of a coproduct, the dual of product, because if I take here in the place of dx, if I take dx to be the initial object, right? Uh, if, if dx is the initial object, then of course this will commute, right? Because anything going out of the initial object is unique. So this composite and the other composite will always equal to each other. The, the same goes there and there. So then the definition of push up just becomes, I've got now, well, I had an L-shaped diagram, but because this is initial, I can just forget about it. So I, I can just start with any two because I can always turn it into an L-shaped diagram in a unique way by inserting the initial object since these morphs will then be unique. So I start with two things and then it's, it's push out out of the initial object is just a diagram like this, such that if I have another diagram like that, um, then there is unique error, and that's exactly the definition of a sum, the, the dual to, to, to product. So let us now, uh, as a way of illustrating this notion for in, in concrete terms, let's look at an, um, let's compute what this push out will be, what a general push out will be in the case of the category of sets. We already know that coproduct will be disjoint union of two sets. And that's kind of easy, easy case of a push out because the initial object in the category of sets is the empty set. But now what if um, here we have something that's not initial? So let's pretend we have uh, three sets, um, A, B, and um, so let's call these B1 and B2. And then we have two functions, um, U1 and U2. Now the question is how to build a push out. And um, we will approach this question in a similar way. We approached the question of how to find um, the universal construction for the um, for this adjunction here. When we, we try to examine the, the kind of liberal nature of this of this mapping to to get an idea what M should have been. So a push out of this thing, right? It kind of brings B1 and B2 together, right? Because it's a set with two functions, yota1 and yota2 into a given object C, a given set C. It brings them together in such a way that the composites are equal, right? So yota1 composed with u1 equals yota2 composed with u2, right? But then, if there is another way of bringing these two things together, let's say by i1 and i2, there must be a unique way, let me, let me call this, uh, what did I call this before? C prime, maybe I should stick to that. Um, there exists a unique way of, of going from there to there. And that means, okay, so first of all, the I1 and I2 needs also to satisfy I1 composed with U1 equals I2 composed with U2. And then the unique U needs to satisfy that U composed with U1 equals I1 and U composed with U2 equals I2. Okay, now the question is how do we find such C, right? And let's try to be, in the beginning, let's try to be as liberal as possible. And then we will see that maybe we can't be too liberal, we have to be a bit conservative, but we'll do it in such a way that we, we are not overly conservative, okay? And, and in the end, we'll, we'll get the construction. And, and this spirit of, of constructing the universe, uh, I mean, concretely constructing something that, that comes from the universe property um, can be used for, for other uh, notions as well. That's why I'm emphasizing the philosophy because this philosophy can guide you uh, to build explicit uh, 
ex build explicitly objects that arise from universal constructions. So what would be the most liberal thing to do? If I have two sets B1 and B2, and I want to put them into another set C, the most liberal thing to do is just take the co-product of B1, uh, take the disjoint union, in other words, right? To take the sum. We already know the sum has a universal property. Um, but that turns out to be too liberal because if I now draw these sets and I just take their, their sum, so maybe I... Okay, let me, let me do it like this. Let me rather use uh, rectangular shapes here. So I have two sets, B1 and B2. Let me color them with orange color. Oops, I think I did something bad. Sorry about that. Let me color them with orange and um, let's say blue. So when we put them together in the most possible liberal way, we get this shape here. Ah, I, I need to close my boundaries there. There we go. But then the problem with this is that I've forgotten about the third set. There, there is a third set as well, right? Which has its own insertion into into these two sets, and and I want this diagram to commute. So if I draw in the third set, let's say the third set um, has color uh, yellow, then um, there will be part of this orange area which is yellow, and there will be part of the blue area, which is also yellow. But, but now these two yellow parts should kind of come together there because we want the composites to be the same. If I pick a random element here, I take it there and there, it should be the same result as first taking there and there. So these two yellow pieces should kind of stick together instead of duplicating them. In a, in a disjoint union, we would have duplicated them, right? But we now don't want to do that. We want to get keep them together. That's, that would be the, the picture we're looking for. Um, okay, so we've, we've now been conservative enough to make sure that the, the diagram commutes. Is this liberal enough to, to be able to have this unique U to, to arbitrary uh, I, I1 and I2? Let's see. Um, if I have functions to another set, I1 and I2. I need to create now a unique function uh, across. Um, well, this set has, has three zones, right? One zone is the orange zone. And if something comes from the orange zone, it will never come from this set. It will always come from that set. Uh, and I can just map then that according to I1 because, so let's call this thing X, because um, I do want, with my U, I do want this equality that, that Yota 1 composed with U equals I1. So if that point in the orange area comes from some X, then it must be mapped by U to wherever I1 maps it. And the same goes for, um, the thing in the in the blue area. So this one must map to I2 of the Y that, that's in the blue area there that, that maps to that point. But what do we do in the in the yellow region? Well, things in the yellow region come from here, right? 
And so perhaps we should map them according to um, how these I1 and I2 map to Z. But there are two paths. We could first go there and then map by I1, or go there and then, sorry, go there and then map by I2. However, these two paths will be the same because of commutativity of the other code, co-com, sorry. So it, it seems to work. So if, if I have a third thing that comes from some Z, I will map it to um, something that will be yota one of u1 of z, which I know equals to yota two, sorry, i2 of u2 of z. Okay, so it, it kind of all seems fine, except that we need to still formalize how we paste together the yellow areas. So I've got my disjoint union of B1 and B2. Um, and now I want to merge the yellow area from B1 with the yellow area from, from B2. And perhaps I'm going to, to, to keep things simpler, what I'm perhaps going to do is to decompose B1 into a union of the image of U1 and the rest. So B1 minus the image of U1. So, so this is my, the image of U1 is the yellow area here, the living inside B1. And B minus image of U1 is the, is the orange area. Then I'll do the same for uh, B2 can be decomposed as image of U2 and the uh, whatever remains. So now that's my blue area, that whole thing. And now I want to put this blue and the orange area together along with the yellow area. And so should I just take A? So the question is, should I just take my, my C to be uh, B minus image of U1 disjoint union with A disjoint union with, sorry, that one should have been B1, right? With B2 minus image of U2. So basically what the picture shows here, so the orange area, I declare this to be exactly the same copy of, of the orange area there. The blue area, I declare to be the same copy of the blue area there. And the yellow area, I simply declare to be a duplicate of this. Can I do that? Duplicating this turns out to be a bit too liberal. Why? Because by this function, right, some of the things here, might be mapping to the same spot here. If I duplicate this over there, how will I ever be able to construct the I1 map? Like, for example, imagine I've got two yellow dots that map to the same place, right? If I keep them separate, if I duplicate that and keep them separate in, in the set C, I now need yota1, but where should yota1 map? Remember, the, the mapping it this way, um, should be the same as mapping the other way, right? So if these two go to the same spot, um, and I mean, even if even if we forget about the other side, so 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 we'll have to pick one, one, one I guess one of these places where yota one should map them. But as soon as we do that then the other spot kind of becomes free from any restrictions. So the, this yellow spot doesn't seem to kind of come from, from here or here at all. And the problem it will cause is that when I will be trying to prove uniqueness of you, I will have a certain degree of freedom where to send this one. And in fact, my degree of freedom will be more than one. I, I will be able to send this one anywhere because it's not bound by 
what you, I, Yota 1 or Yota 2 are doing, you see. And so then I don't want them to be separate if, if they get to be the same inside X and, and the same on the other side. So I actually don't want to do the A because then I will struggle proving uniqueness of U. What I want instead is to quotient A out by, um, by an equivalence relation. So those things that map to the same place by the U1 map, I want them to be still the same there, but at the same time, I want those things that symmetrically, I want those things that map to the same place by this mapping still to be the same over there, not, not to get this extra degree of freedom. So I'm going to be quotient out A by two equivalence relations. But if I want to quotient by two equivalence relations simultaneously, first I need to join these equivalence relations, right? And then and then quotient them. So I'm going to do this, A quotient by the join of the two equivalence relations. So this will be the smallest equivalence relation that contains both E1 and E2, where um, the E1 and the E2 are defined as the so-called kernel relations of, of U1 and U2. So E1 is the set of all pairs A1, A2 in A cross A, such that uh, U1 of A1 equals U1 of A2, and E2 is the set of all pairs um, B1, uh, no, it shouldn't be B1, so it should still be A1, A2. A1, A2 in A cross A, such that U2, A2 equals, U2, A1, sorry, equals U2, A2. Okay, so, so let's draw a simple, um, finite model of, of this construction. So let's say our set A consists of, um, let's say, nine points. And let's, um, let's draw in the equivalence relations E1 and E2. So maybe the equivalence relation um, E1 should, should be like this. So what does that mean? That means that our B1 consists of something that 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 is where the, all three of these are being ma mapped to, something else where all three of those are being mapped to, and then one for each of these. So these are our yellow points in, in B1 but there might be also some orange points, something that does not come from A at all. So let's add some, a few orange points. So maybe we use the colors here as well to indicate the origin of these points. So that's our B, um, B1. And now let's look at another um, equivalence relation to, to see how we, we map to B2. And maybe for the other relation, we simply take, um, we're going to use a different color for that. Maybe blue would be appropriate. So let's say the relation is like these two are the same, and then these two are the same, and then those two are the same, and perhaps these two are the same, and then it's just the singleton class there. Okay, so. What will happen here? The blue points of, uh, sorry, the yellow points of um, of B two will come from these um, equivalence classes. So there will be one for for that one. Maybe I should use a 
blue arrow there. So one for that one. So it gives me a yellow point there. Then there is another one coming from here. Gives me another yellow point. Then there is a third one coming from there. And then there are two more, right? That one. And um, this one. So these are the yellow points of the set B2. And perhaps B2 also has some extra elements which do not come from A, let's say three extra blue points. In the other case, the extra points should have been orange. So according to our uh, construction of this pushout, uh, we'll have the, basically the orange and the blue points will be just duplicated, right? So there will be two of orange ones and there will be three of the blue ones. But it's difficult to predict now how many yellow there will be because what we need to do is to take this set and quotient it out by the join of the two equivalence relations. So we need to take the union of these equivalence relations. What does it mean? We need to take the equi smallest equivalence relation, uh, which kind of um, sticks together all the equivalence classes. So what would that be? Let's examine that. So you see, here we had one equivalence class based on one relation, but then that equivalence class means that these three are equivalent to each other, but by the other relation, these two are equivalent. So then by the join of the two, all of these will be equivalent. But in the same way, these two are equivalent by the other one. So all of these will be equivalent. So eventually this whole thing will, will have just equivalent things in it. So the, the join of, um, of the two equivalence relations will stick all of these points together. And then for the same reason, um, these two are equivalent, right? They were in singleton classes for the first relation, but for the second one, they become equivalent. So they must stay together. And this one was singleton for both relations. So that's the join of the two uh, equivalence relations. And now we know uh, what the yellow points will be in C because they have to be equivalent classes of these according to what we defined here. And so there will be three of them. Um, and where will the yellow points from one or the other map to? Uh, well, um, the first one is the representative of, of this big class, let's say. Let's say the second one is, the, is that one, and the third one is the remaining one. So the yellow points here, which come from this big blob, are these two. So both of them, both of these will map there, right? And then uh, this is the, the lonesome guy. And these two also map to the same place because um, they belong to, to this. What about the other picture? Well, there we had one, two, three that came together. So these were exactly, uh, if I follow the arrows, these three. Um, so these three, now my picture gets very complex. These three go there. Uh, this one was representative of those two and that, that gets mapped there. And this one is the one that's coming from the uh, lonesome point there. Okay, the, the picture kind of shows us what's going on, but now we need to formally prove the, the universal property right? that this construction actually does work. Um, well, somehow the picture kind of convinces us that the diagram will commute because that, I mean, that was the whole point of joining the equivalence relations, right? Uh, but let, let's also carry this out formally. So we now want to, to show, firstly, we want to define um, the mappings, right? So we have B1, B2, U1, U2, C. We want to define Yota1 and Yota2. Yota1 
of um, B, which is which comes from the um, orange area. So if B is an element of B1 minus image of U1, yota one of that, let, let me allow myself to use this notation here. One usually doesn't do that, but um, just to not, not to waste too much time and, and also not to strain further our eyes with too many, uh, too much text. So yota one of that kind of element will be just the, um, I'm going to call this B to the power one. It will be just a copy of this B1 inside C, which was built as a disjoint union. So this is the, the orange points just mapping to their identical copies in the disjoint union. Um, what about yota one of the yellow points? So yota one of some B inside um, the image of U1. Well, that we define as, okay, so if, if B is in the image of U1, then, then, then B will be equal to U1 of some A, right? Uh, and this should, should still be yota 1. So what will be yota 1 of U1 of A? Um, so here's my, my A, let's say this one. This is my, a. And how do I map it there? Um, well, how do I map this corresponding point there? I retrace it back here, right? And then I map it according to what the quotient did to, to, to this element, right? We took, we took the quotient and then inserted it there. So it will be um, the equivalence class of um, A under the join of the two equivalence relations. But then we need to take the corresponding copy in this disjoint union. And because the disjoint union has three terms, I'm using the superscript one for the copies in the first term, and I will use superscript two for copies in the second term. All right, so so yota two will be defined in a similar way. Um, so in other words, yota two of um, e, b, which is element of b my b two minus image of u two, uh, will be the same b, but it's copy in, in the third component of this joint union, and yota two of some u uh, two of um, a. Uh, will equal to the equivalence class of A, but it's copying the third component. Ah, sorry, in the second component. There is one little issue here with this, this equality and that equality, because these equalities are defined in terms of A, rather in terms of the value U1 A, I need to make sure they're well defined. But of course, they're well defined because uh, if I change A with A prime, here I will have a equivalence class of A prime, but under which relation? Under E1 join E2 relation. So if I have an A prime such that U of A equals U1 of A equals U1 of A prime, then that, that, that would make the pair A A prime be in the E1 relation, right? And so their equivalence classes will be the same. So, so these equalities do indeed define uh, I mean, uh, yota one and yota two defined by this uh, data is, is indeed are indeed well defined. Fine. So, so now the last thing that remains to show is is the the, the universal property itself. So I've defined yota one and yota two. Now, what if I have um, some maps to some C prime with I one and I two? I want this unique. U. How will I get the unique U? Um, so U is coming out of a disjoint union, right? And so the, the, these pieces do not intersect each other inside C. So to define U, I need to just define it on each of the pieces. 
So u of some um, p1 will be simply defined as uh, i1 of the corresponding p. And that will make the triangle commutative because yota one injects those things coming from B1 minus image of U1 in, in, injectively by just take their copies in the disjoint union. In the same way, U of B3 in a similar way, but that, now that one is the one that's, that comes from here. So that will be defined as um, Yota 2 is defined. And then finally, um, U of uh, an equivalence class of A's will be defined by uh, whatever your, uh, I1 composed with U1 do with that element, which is equal to I2 composed with um, U2 by the fact that this should have been commutative. However, the question is whether this is well defined, right? Okay, so, that, so that's one question, whether this defines uh, you well. And the other question is whether um, you is unique. So if, if, this def if this definition, if this function you define this way is well defined, then we know it exists, but then we still want to show that it's unique. These two pieces of definition of you are forced by commutativity of these triangles. So now we will see that also this one is forced. Why? Because um, it, it is forced once again by commutativity of those triangles. Because remember, um, to get here, to get here, we need to first get to to be one with u one a, and then we compose with yota one. And so. Um, U composed with the equivalence, uh, U of the equivalence class um, is equal to U of Yota one of U one A and that is forced to equal because u with yota one is forced to be i one. That is forced to equal to i one of u one of a. So u definitely is unique. Even this equality, which we don't know yet if if, if it if it can define u like that, we still still have to check well definedness of u. But at least we know that this equality is forced. Okay, so how do we know that U is well defined this way? Um, I need to now take another representative of the same equivalence class and check that U will give me the same value. So let, let A and A prime, so let A prime be another representative of the same equivalence class. If I had operated U in, in terms of A prime, I would have gotten the answer I1 composed with U1 com uh, of A prime, right? I want to know that this is equal to I1 composed with U1 of A. Now, what does it mean that A prime is in the equivalence class of A? It's it's the equivalence relation which joins E1 and E2. And and if you if you know how to how to generate equivalence relations from relation, you would know that joining of the coolness relation can be achieved by taking zigzags. So basically, A and A prime will be related by a zigzag of some A1, A2, up to A3, A4. Let, let's just use a uh, finite, I mean, certain number of these uh, um, to keep notation simpler. It will be obvious how to generalize for an N, right? 
So let's say there, the zigzag has, has this length um, uh, five, where this one is related by E1, those are related by E2, these are related by E1, those are related by E2, and these are related by E1. Okay, fine. Now we start computing. So yota one, U1 of A prime, Remember what being related by E1 means. It means that U1 of, of this is the same as U1 of A4. So then it will be equal to Yota 1 of U1 of A4. But of course, Yota 1 of U1 of A4 is the same as Yota 2 of U2 of A4 because um, this thing here commutes. And I did it deliberately, that switch, so that now I can say that u2 of a4 must be equal to u2 of a3 because a3 and a4 are related by each other by e2. Sorry, let me just make my screen a bit bigger. And then I, I do my switch again. Um, this is the same as yota one of u one of a three. And now I have that u one of a three is u um, one of a two. I one of u one of a two. Then I do again the switch. It's the same as i two of u two of a two. And then I know that that the same as i two of u two of a one because of, of this relation. And then I need to do it one more time. I1 of U1 of A1, and I know that is the same as I1 of U1 of A. And that's exactly what I wanted to prove. You see, these, that these two are equal to each other. And of course, if I have a longer chain, I, I, my equations will be just longer, so it will, it will be proved by induction. But I will get to where I want to, namely that uh, this is uh, um, this, um, this definition of so, so U defined this way is well defined. Huh? I already we already talked about why it must be unique, and, and so then the result has been proven. Um, you see, it, it, I kind of deliberately wanted to take you on this very similar kind of technical journey of unpacking the pushout because. You can now imagine that all these technicalities that are involved here about basically, I mean, the, the crux of the matter here is the joining of the two equivalence relations, right? And you see how complex the, situ the, the situation is here. But now this complex story of, of joining equivalence relations, right, gets encoded by the simple property of a pushout. And this is where category theory will make mathematics simpler. You can imagine various complicated constructions using equivalence relations now being reduced to some, some simple di diagrammatic properties of pushouts by the fact that pieces of those constructions are simply kind of almost like enclosed within the universal property of the pushout itself. So if I would want to prove something about equivalence relations, instead of using this technical language of equivalence relations and induction and chains, I will simply use the universal property of the corresponding pushout. And that simplification uh, is not just an accident in this case. Uh, that simplification is, is the purpose of universal constructions. Very often, the objects that we build um, using a, a universal construction are very technical to describe in, in, in terms of elements. Like for example, coming back here in the case of, um, of the monoid of words, it, it, take, it will take a, a, um, a few lines to, 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 this, to define uh, the monoid of words, right? But then in the end, because the universal property uh, determines this monoid uniquely up to isomorphism, um, most of the things you would want to prove about free monoids 
can be deduced just from the universal property using simpler uh, categorical diagram type of arguments, not having to go into technicalities of elements. Um, to some extent, the same applies for, for adjunctions. It's sometimes easier to work with adjunctions in terms of its universal property. Uh, in some sense, the same applies to this complex number situation where um, I no longer have to worry about the fact how complex numbers are defined. Um, but in the complex number case, the definition is not too complicated in a sense. In the natural number case, the definition is a bit more complicated than the simple principle of recursion, the principle of induction, and the, the other axioms that you need to put on the system. So the, the, the summary of the story is that that um, many constructions in mathematics um, arise as uh, universal constructions, which means that they, they are, arise as initial objects in a certain category. And this can be made use of um, in terms of a more simplified way of ut utilizing these constructions, where instead of having to each time delve into some technicalities that describe your construction, that build your construction out of elements, you will be able to um, simply make use of a universal property to come to the conclusions that you wanted to come to. And the universal property language is much simpler language because, I mean, you already can see here. So, I mean, to, to, to this, to describe the C already was a bit of an effort. And then to prove that it has the universal property was quite an effort. But now, once we prove the universal property, now we can use it for proving other things. And so many other theorems that would have implicitly made use of this technical argument, this technical argument can be cut short because then we have a general theorem saying that um, the universal property holds. So then, then it can be used. All right, um, I will I will then end um, here. I just want to also remark that uh, when dealing with um, algebraic categories, colimits are quite technical to construct. Um, we will have to do something like this, but then an extra technicality that will come in there is is the fact that now. When you simply, let's say, take this joint union of two things, now you want that thing to be still closed under operation. So you would have to expand this object further and further to get the push out. Um, but um, on the other hand, dually for algebraic categories, limits are, are, are easier to construct because there you just take uh, sets of tuples. We didn't describe in general what limits are, but um, they turn out to be, um, I mean, so here already we used, kind of hinted on the fact that the, 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 the column, the push out in this example, can be constructed by first taking the co-product and then kind of cautioning out um, the thing in the co-product. So in the beginning, the thing we had here was A, and then we kind of cautioned it that out, right? And already co-product for algebraic categories is, is a bit complex. So you, you need this complex construction of co product and then some some quotienting which which in algebraic context is a bit complex uh, whereas dually the construction of a limit can be achieved by taking product and then uh, sub algebra or, or sub object I mean that's much easier uh, it's much easier to take a sub algebra than a quotient algebra and the product is easy because it's just a set of tuples for geometric categories, though, like for example, for the category of topological spaces, it kind of turns out that almost the other way around is true, um, where colimits are just easy things. You just put put things together the way we, we did it with sets. Um, there's not much to do there um, on top of what we already did here. But to describe, let's say, uh, topology on the Cartesian product of two topological spaces, that, that is much more elaborate business than describing topology on the push out, where it would just be topology generated by the, the ones coming from, the, from here and there. 
All right, so um, one maybe final point. Um, we we perha perhaps haven't seen too much of like uh, technical arguments like we had uh, the end here. Um, and in general, category theory tries to avoid such technical arguments, but as soon as you want to link up the category theory you're doing with the existing mathematics, uh, in the in the first instances of this linkage, you will have to go through some technicalities. So, so the beginning is always a bit uh, maybe unpleasant because you you have to relate the simple general notions with some technical constructions, and you do want to do this relationship because your goal eventually is to simplify mathematics. But once you once you have that set up, once you know which technical um, complicated uh, constructions or concepts um, correspond to the to, to simpler framework on the category side then then after that um, then you work on the category side and, and you, you use those properties you've extracted from the, from the complexity of, of concrete mathematics to get other properties in a simpler way and then you apply it back and you can get these consequences Kind of almost like avoiding the technicality of the concrete subject you're working in. But um, this does not mean that it is always possible. At least we we haven't um, rewritten all of mathematics yet <laughs> in in the simpler approach of categories. Um, and in, in a sense large part of research in category theory is, is trying to do that. Uh, but you, you don't want to just rewrite something. You want to rewrite it in such a way that the, the rewritten version is not only simpler, but it's also more general so that it applies to other examples as well. But then category theory itself is part of mathematics. <laughs> and as being part of mathematics in that subject, at some point, you also encounter technicalities. Uh, and so there are some parts of category theory which would become quite technical. And then you try there again to apply the same category theory to unpack those technicalities. But sometimes you're forced to move up, up the dimensions, like go to two-dimensional categories or three-dimensional categories. And when you force yourself to go to infinite dimensional categories, then again, things might become um, along the way uh, technical. Um, so category theory is not a... It, it, it does not uh, does not uh, eliminate uh, the need of uh, technicalities. It just tries modestly to sometimes eliminate that need. Uh, but we're not we're not claiming that it can always be eliminated. So this will then be the last lecture for. Um, our course, and maybe in some future we will continue from from where we left off. I would like to thank you all for your participation and uh, attendance, as well live attendance as well as uh, offline attendance, and uh, for your questions and and for your contributions during the lectures. Many of the, these lectures were shaped based on your contributions during the lecture or the discussions we used to have before we started recording that determined the course of the lecture. <laughs>